Hi, my name is Dean Nelson. I've been blessed to be in the digital infrastructure industry for over 30 years. I started on my 21st birthday at a company called Sun Microsystems, doing component level debug on server hardware. For many of you watching, I was in the exact same position you are, trying to figure out what my future would look like, what career path I would take. Keep in mind, I had no experience, no connections, and zero knowledge about what the Silicon Valley was. I was also unaware of how critical technology would become to every person on this planet. So let's fast forward to today. These devices are an integral part of our daily lives. We use them for almost everything we do. We're not only dependent on them, we're addicted. It's hard to imagine life without everything we'd ever need to know or want right at our fingertips. This generation is known as digital natives, growing up in a world that has always been connected, always online. You tap an app on your phone and immediately get what you need. Instant gratification with content from every corner of the globe. Have you ever thought about how it works? What's behind that tap? There's definitely a lot happening on your phone, but there's also a super complex system working behind your phone's apps. Without it, that phone would be about as useful as a brick. Most people are vaguely aware that this has something to do with the cloud. That's one element. But the internet is really a vast array of internetworked systems with billions of devices all connected through a global network. Now I want you to ask yourself this question. Where would we be today if we didn't have this digital foundation during the coronavirus pandemic? Our society would have slowed to a crawl, even regressed. Today, I want to take you behind the curtain, lift the hood, so to speak, to see how this digital infrastructure works. So let's start with an app on your phone. It could be Instagram, TikTok, Amazon, even Starbucks ordering a coffee. Apps create the user experience. They determine what you see and hear, how that information is formatted, and they structure your interaction. Like, I'm waiting for you to click on one of these three hyperlinks, or I'll present you the video clip when it enters your screen view, and then I'll wait to see what you click on next. Apps are the container for the data, but in most cases, the data comes to the app over the internet. So when you open an app, it establishes a connection with a larger computer called a server. Those servers are sitting in a data factory, and those are called data centers. And they're somewhere around the world. Those servers send the apps the content they need. They also predict and prepare more content based on what you are doing and what you might do next. As you use the app, it requests data from the servers and they serve it up. That's why they're called servers. Data travels back and forth from the app's servers to your phone in things called packets. Think of a packet like a package full of digital information. Sometimes a packet can be one simple bit of information. The other times, large files or streams are broken down into many packets. For example, Netflix will send millions of packets from their servers to your phone as you watch the latest episode of Black Mirror. To make this possible, there are devices called routers. They tell the packets where to go. Each packet has a number and an address, where it came from and where it's going to go, so that all the routers along the way can tell it where to go next. Every device on the internet has a unique address, like a house on a street. When you send a packet from your house, it needs directions on how to get to its destination. These routers act like a turn-by-turn -turn navigation system. When you hit the end of the street, it tells you which way to go. It has many predefined paths you can take to get there. It will tell you which one will get you there fastest and if there are any issues along the way that you need to route around. One of the most fascinating things that I learned about networking early on in my career was that these packets are sent asynchronously. So when you send a request to watch this movie, the Netflix servers prepare to start streaming that video to you, but when it starts to send the video, the data is too large for one packet. So it breaks them up into thousands of packets, then blasts them all out to you in parallel. Those packets follow their own path to get to you. They are then reassembled at your phone as you watch. Sometimes one path goes down or there's a delay and a packet is lost. No problem, the server just sends another one. You can have a Zoom call with somebody on a different continent with lost packets and retransmissions, but it looks smooth and seamless to you. This all happens at the speed of light with billions of others using the same pathway simultaneously. So let's follow a packet from your device to the server. We're gonna name her Poly Packet. You've tapped something on your phone. The phone's operating system makes a decision and creates the packet to send. 
It fills Polly with the needed data, includes the source address where it came from, like your house address, the destination address, the receiving server, and other information to make sure it can correctly reassemble the packets on the other end. Polly is then launched onto the local area network. This is usually the network in your home or office. The LAN works just like the internet, but at a much smaller scale. It doesn't need as many addresses as the internet because there just aren't that many devices in your home. By the way, back when computer networking was just getting started, there were only small private networks, like LANs, each with their own device addressing system. Computers on one network couldn't really talk to those on another. The innovation of the internet was figuring out how to interconnect different networks and provide consistent ways for them to communicate. They created a standard called TCP IP. That's why it's called the internet. It's a bunch of interconnected networks. But back to Polly. Let's say your phone is connected via Wi-Fi. So when Polly leaves your phone, it is encoded into radio waves and transmitted through the air to your home's Wi-Fi router. That's over the ether. This is where Polly is reassembled and sent out through copper wires, also called ethernet, and they go to your cable modem. Now this is the first time that Polly is going to enter the internet. The cable modem has an internet address known to all of the computers on the planet. Or maybe you're away from your home and your phone is connected via mobile data like 4G. In that case, Polly Packet is transmitted via radio waves again through the air to your local cell tower where she is turned back into electrons and encoded into light beams that travel through strands of glass thinner than a human hair. These are bundled into fiber optic cables which allow Polly to connect to the internet. On a side note, these fiber optic cables span massive distances, including crossing every ocean on the planet. When you watch that cat video from China, that data is traversing a massive distance, almost at the speed of light. Once Polly is connected, the router forwards her to the next router along the path until she arrives at her destination. Once she arrives at the destination, Polly Packet is reunited with her brother and sister packets and inform the server about what data to send to the app. This ends Polly Packet's journey until she is recreated to start that process all over again. This process happens again and again all over the world. The scale of these transmissions is mind-boggling. By the end of 2020, we are expected to generate 44 zettabytes of data. That's 40 times more bytes than there are stars in the observable universe. If you stored all that information on DVDs and stacked them on top of each other, they would reach the moon 15 times. They would wrap around the Earth 280 times. And this data growth is not slowing down. We are expected to generate 175 zettabytes of data per year by 2025. Why is that much data being generated? It's pretty simple. It's because of you and me. Every day, there are 500 million tweets, 5 billion searches with 3.5 billion searches being done on Google alone. There are 6 billion videos watched on YouTube. 65 billion messages sent over WhatsApp with 2 billion minutes of voice and video calls. The internet spans the globe like a web. It connects people, cities, and continents through cell towers, fiber optic cables under the ground, overhead and telephone poles, and along the ocean floor. All of this is powered by data factories called data centers, filled with millions of servers processing your ever-growing requests. It allows us to have fun, like sending an image on Instagram of what your dog had for breakfast, to stay connected with friends and family, as well as extremely important society-altering things like the collaboration that decoded the human genome, or sharing information about finding a vaccine for COVID-19. Digital infrastructure is the physical foundation of the internet. It is what connects us all. And make no mistake, without this system, the world we know would stop. 30 years ago, I happened into this industry. My goal today is to help you learn more about it and to consider a career in digital infrastructure. We are one of the fastest growing industries on the planet, and we need bright, curious, creative minds like yours to help it to continue to grow. I can assure you that there are even more opportunities for you in this industry today than there were for me 30 years ago. You just need to take that first step and join us. Thanks for watching.